This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used, for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again on this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in the section on distillation and rectification and in this video I would like to show you something on single stage continuous distillation. We have seen in principle already how that works in this diagram. Uh, we see that we have a continuous feed that is being fed into the reboiler. Heat is being added continuously so as to partially evaporate the feed and then uh, you wind up with a vapor, of course, and if you require a liquid stream in the following process steps, you can condense that so that you have a liquid distillate, or, of course, you can also omit this uh, condenser if you would have, like to have a vapor flow leaving this equipment and entering the next process step. At the bottom, you have your bottom product or your bottoms, and so the feed is being separated into the distillate and the bottom product. Now again, before we uh, want to uh, set up the balances, we first have to uh, define our variables that describe all the things that are relevant. Uh, this is shown on this diagram. Here we see that there is the feed entering, which is called F dot. Dot always refers to something per time, so it's a flow rate, amount of substance per time, for example, in this case, and it has a composition XF. I omit the i, of course, we have the xf of all the components, so in principle it's an xf i of all the components. And also here I should mention that you can either describe that on an amount of substance basis or on a mass basis, and as argued before, I will stick here with the version with respect to amount of substance, because to me that appears to be more natural with respect to the equilibrium information. But you can convert everything or interpret all the equations on a mass basis and you will get the identical results in the end. You only have to do it consistently, that is to use also the equilibrium information on a mass basis. The distillate is called D dot. And if condensation takes place, we assume that it's completely condensed to liquid. So the volume or the, the amount of substance flow rate here is the same as there. Nothing changes. Only here it's a liquid, so we would call that an X. Uh, as usual, for referring to the liquid, whereas this is a Y, Y referring to vapor. According to ordinary um, conventions, the D referring, of course, to the distillate. And then this XD, of course, is the same as the YD, if we assume that complete condensation took place over here. And that's what we actually assume. I mean, in principle, you could set, could set up the balance for the YD, but for simplicity or for, well, because this is a typical step to condense that we will operate that or write that down with an XD, but you can write it down with a YD as well, if you like. The bottom product uh, flow rate is B dot amount of substance per time again of this bottom product and the composition is called XB. So everything is more or less almost easy to remember. So it's an F entering, a feed entering, a distillate and a bottom leaving. So the feed is split up into the D dot and the B dot. Of course also some heat is being supplied. This is the heat per time again, the energy per time. So this is a Q dot in this case. Setting up the balances in the lecture, we don't deal with that, but of course you can also determine the amount of heat or the power that you need, the reboiler power, the reboiler duty um, that you need in order to evaporate the uh, feed partially so that you wind up with your both flow rates at the exit of the equipment, your distillate and your bottom product. And as before, before we set up the um, balances, we would first like to know a little bit how we can uh, describe that graphically and to somehow find out how we can describe that. Uh, this already contains some of the results 
But let's first look at the principal things. Again, we assume that we have a constant pressure. I mean, what we assume, of course, in such a continuously operated process, as we have discussed before, is that we have steady state. Steady state means that at any point in the entire process, everything is constant. The composition is constant at every point with respect to time, so it doesn't change with time. The density, the viscosity, everything is constant. And of course, also the local and the global flow rates are constant. That means, in turn, that of course there cannot be any accumulation within the equipment because that would blow up in the end if there would be some uh, accumulation. So we can forget the accumulation term. We can forget the left hand side of the balance. We will see that later. So we assume that we have a continuous steady state process and we start out with a feed composition somewhere in the middle of the composition, uh, composition range and uh, of course we have to heat that up until we reach the two-phase region same diagram as before vapor on top at high temperatures liquid at low temperatures so the vertical axis is the temperature and the composition on the horizontal axis in between the two-phase region and we have to supply energy the reboiler duty has to be high enough as to change the state of the feed so that we are within the two-phase region because then of course the phase, the feed will split into two phases, a liquid and a vapor phase and they are of course, since we are assuming a theoretical stage, they are in equilibrium. And actually that's really what is taking place. Usually if you have a well-mixed feed uh, then it splits in usually very easily into phases that are very close to equilibrium. Of course, if they are in equilibrium, the points on the boiling point and the dew point line are uh, linked by a horizontal tie line. The tie line has to be horizontal because the temperature in two equilibrium phases is identical and temperature constant means that we are on a horizontal line. And so this and that point on the boiling point and on the dew point line, they are those points that correspond to the equilibrium phases that are leaving our theoretical stage. Okay, so we have to supply the heat somewhere into that range and this will be our uh, situation later. Of course, this diagram already contains some of the variables that we have to define, that we will find out from our balances. So let's set up the balances and look what we will wind up with. Okay, again we have to set up the balances the usual way. Same thing as before, as same thing as we have seen for the batch distillation. So we have two types of balances, or two equations more or less. One is the overall balance, meaning we are regarding the overall amount of substance. And as I said, there's no accumulation, so the change within our control volume, oh, I forgot to mention the control volume, of course, it has been shown in the diagram before in here. So this is the control volume. The feed is entering, the distillate and the bottom product are leaving. More or less trivial, but nevertheless, that's what we want to look at. And if you want to set up the balance, of course, the F dot is entering, the D dot and the B dot is leaving. And since it's a, a process in steady state, there is no accumulation, so nothing is changing within. And that defines the balance more or less. So nothing changes within, so zero equals. This is the overall balance. What is entering? Well, entering is the feed minus what is leaving, and leaving is the D dot and the B dot. Here you see, for example, that you can have more than one stream or one, more than one contribution to either of the terms of the balance. So there's one term describing what is entering and two terms that describe what is leaving our control volume. So this is the overall balance. And then we have to set up the same thing for an individual component. Again, no accumulation within, so zero equals. And now we have to write what is entering of component I with the feed stream, and that is of course the F dot times the corresponding mole fraction. It's the XF of component I minus 
what is leaving it is of course the distillate with the corresponding composition, so it's the XDI, that's the fraction of component I in the distillate stream, minus the B dot times XBI. So it's always the same structure, flow rate times the corresponding mole fraction is the amount of substance per time of component I leaving as bottom product, as distillate product, and what is entering of component I as feed. And that is, of course, the balance for component I. Okay, now we do the same things as before. We use the overall balance, solve it for one of the flow rates, plug that into the uh, second equation, and then we will see what we will be winding up with. We solve the first equation for f dot. So f dot equals b dot plus d dot. And if we substitute that in the bottom equation, we get, in the second equation, we get 0 equals b dot times xfi plus d dot times xfi minus those two terms that are present in the uh, second equation anyway, so that's the minus d dot x di minus b dot x bi. The next thing we do is that we separate the d dots and the b dots. Yeah, we can sort the terms, so to speak, with respect to d dot and b dot, and we write actually the d dot on the left hand side of the equation, so we get a d dot times, if we bring everything on the other side, the x di has a positive sign minus xfi equals the b dot times positive is the xfi on the right hand side of the equation minus the xbi. And now we solve for the ratio of um, b dot and d dot. Now come on. So it's the, for example, the d dot over b dot. And usually one prefers if one writes ratios top versus bottom, partition coefficient is top phase with respect to bottom phase, flow rates, it's easier to remember top thing versus bottom thing, so it's a distillate versus the bottom product. In that case, it's easier to remember that that is the ratio we have been regarding. And this equals xfi minus xbi divided by xdi minus xfi. And we realize that these concentration differences correspond to the length of lines in the concentration or in the diagram that contains concentration. So in the diagram we had before, for example, and we want to rename those lengths of the lines uh, as A and B. So we want to call this A over B. And we will see later on that this is, or we will see in just a moment, that this is the so-called lever rule. That is, the ratio of flow rates corresponds to the ratios of length of lines in the equilibrium diagram. Which lines are that? Oh, for, before I, do, I go to the diagram, I should give that a box, because that is our final uh, important result, so to speak. And now we can look what that means actually in the diagram. You have to go to this diagram again, and here we see now the two uh, uh, ratio, so the two, two length of the line. So this is the xf minus the xb, which we called a, and this is the xd minus xf, which we called b. For the specific case we regarded, where we have this xf1 heated up to this green horizontal tie line, so that that is our xd1 and this is our xb1. I should mention, of course, that again we are regarding only a binary system if we represent it that graphically. And uh, so that this is the XB1 and this is the XD1 and of course the XF1. And again, component 1 being the light boiling component, 2 being the heavy boiling component in that binary system. Okay, well, how was that? D dot over B dot equals A over B. So the D dot corresponding to the, this composition 
is more or less proportional to the length of A to the length of this line. The composition of uh, the flow rate of the bottom product, it's in the denominator, so it corresponds to this composition, is proportional to this, to the length of this line. Of, actually, of course, it's a ratio that is proportional to the ratio of these lines. But nevertheless, one can say that the d dot times this is the b dot times that. So it's always the opposite side. The longer the a, the larger is the d dot, the longer the b, the larger is the b dot, the bottom's product flow rate. Okay, and we realize, of course, now if we vary our heat that we supply, our reboiler duty, we will reach different temperatures. So the reboiler duty defines where we finally wind up in this two-phase region. If we heat too much, we are in a single-phase vapor phase. That's not what we, want, what we want to have, so we want to stay within. And we can ask ourselves, well, what are the limiting cases? So we start out with the liquid XF, for example, heat it up and increase the reboiler duty until we reach a very this point where we have a very small vapor flow rate vapor flow rate distillate flow rate because a in this at this point is approaching zero so we don't have any distillate flow rate but at the same time we re realize that our xd is at maximum it's the maximum value of the distillate composition that we can achieve the maximum er enrichment of the light boiling component in our distillate so we get high purity, but no product. Bad. Same thing, of course, the other way around. If we heat further until we evaporate more or less uh, the entire liquid, only a very small, small fraction of liquid may remain up here. So the B is now approaching zero. That length that is more or less characterizing our B dot in this ratio. That means here we don't have any bottom product or only a very small amount of bottom product in this region up here, but we get the lowest composition of the bottom product that is the maximum enrichment with respect to the heavy boiling component in our bottom product in this case. But we wind up with no product or approaching the case of no product. That is, the higher our purity demand, the lower is the flow rate that we get of the corresponding product. So also here one can say for the continuous single-stage distillation that there are limits, so to speak. Either the vapor equilibrium is such that we have a very uh, wide two-phase region, so that th that is of course the case if the uh, vapor pressures of the both components differ significantly, then the Y and the X differ significantly, that we had seen that already for the uh, batch distillation, in that case the relative volatility is high and that way we are able to separate the two phases in just a single stage to a significant extent. So that would mean that the, these two blue lines uh, diverge, so to speak, quite uh, strongly so that we get an A, uh, the, the composition here which is very far on that side and the, uh, the, X, the, the XD very far on, on that side. So if the two-phase region is very wide, we get purity, a high purity of all products. That means, again, we have a requirement for our system on the one hand side. So if the system is appropriate, the relative volatility is high, only in that case we can get significant flow rates and high purities. Or if the system is not such, then our problem is that we get high purities only if we have low flow rates and also in that case the flow rates and the purities are limited. So we can't get beyond that concentration for the distillate and we can't get below uh, this concentration for the bottom product if you start out from this feed composition. So there are significant and severe limits to the single stage distillation. Nevertheless, single stage continuous distillation is sometimes operated usually called a flash. You are flashing a liquid either by heating, uh, by, by supplying heat, or you can also do that sometimes by reducing the pressure. And that also, of course, leads to a two-phase system where you can remove, for example, uh, gases, well, light boiling well, gases like 
uh, air or something like that or some other uh, very light boiling uh, carbohydrates from your um, from a liquid flow rate for example so in that uh, point uh, that uh, way you are able to separate of course uh, light boiling components from a liquid a heavy boiling liquid within a single flash stage or a single continuous a single stage distillation Okay, so this is operated sometimes if the system allows to do that, otherwise you would perhaps think of other processes, multi-stage processes. With that I would like to summarize what we have learned here. We have seen on the one hand side that, that we can design, so to speak, the sin single stage continuous distillation with the help of the so-called lever rule which can again easily be derived from uh, balances. And we also see that for the continuous single stage distillation, uh, efficient separation is only possible if the components that to be separated differ significantly in uh, volatility or if the purity requirements are not too high. And then of course we have also seen this competition between flow rate and purity. Okay, so single stage separation apparently is not the optimum and that's why in the next video I will tell you something how one can combine several steps, several theoretical stages in order to achieve a higher purity. With that, thank you for today and hope to see you again in the next video.